welcome uh, to our um, uh, seminar series, the CISOC seminar series. This is week five. Um, and uh, as most of you uh, know, uh, or those who've been in our previous seminars, uh, this is a uh, seminar series about global Southeast Europe and uh, how the region engages with, uh, with the rest of the world. It's uh, both country specific as well as thematic. We have discussed issues like um, the region in a multipolar world, international politics, uh, we have discussed energy, uh, diaspora. Next week we've got migration. Um, and uh, this week we've got uh, the influence of radicalism and uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism in the region. And uh, we have um, two uh, great experts here. Uh, first of all, our, our, um, the chair of our um, the session is Faisal Devji. He's the director of the uh, Asian Studies Center here and has written ex extensively on uh, these matters. And uh, we recently had also a very good conversation at the Nissan on the Charlie Hebdo. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the uh, of, uh, of our um, uh, participants in the conversation. And so um, Faisal will be uh, chairing this talk and at the same time intervening as well uh, as an active chair. And I'm really pleased that, that uh, Kerem Akhtem, who's been one of people that have created CISOX together with, uh, with myself and our other uh, colleagues, and uh, has moved uh, to Graz University. He's a professor of uh, Turkish studies there, uh, but he will never abandon this place because he keeps on coming back, which is great. Um, and uh, Kerem, among other things that he's done, uh, he's also done um, a beautiful project and, um, uh, and a great publication on the Islam in the Balkans, uh, which is also relevant to our work today. So with that, I'll leave you and uh, thank you. look forward to our discussion. Um, great. Well, thank you. I mean, I have to say it's very moving uh, being here because it's been almost a year uh, uh, since I've left. And, uh, you know, first I needed some time to settle in. Uh, in Graz in Austria and to learn to teach not one or two or maybe three uh, students in a tutorial but you know 50 or 60 that was quite uh, a challenge but it's a great place it's great being there but being back is, is also great and uh, thanks Othon uh, for the wonderful introduction and thank you all for coming it's also great to see uh, uh, many faces many friends here in this room um, of course, uh, the topic we will be talking about today is not necessarily a very, um, a very cozy one. It's one which has been um, on our minds uh, here in Europe and elsewhere in the Muslim world as well for quite a while. I'll talk about religion and radicalization um, in the Balkans, but not only in the Balkans, and try to uh, give a few points of departure to talk about the actors <coughs> the networks, but also the scope and the scale of things we're talking about and the question of how concerned we have to be. Now, obviously, uh, the last events, uh, Charlie Hebdo was a terrible reminder, but then we, you know, <laughs> there are constantly new reminders coming in. We know that jihadi terrorism and the radicalization which comes with it is a serious security challenge, um, which is in a way strange for me to say because I come from a uh, critical perspective where security and terrorism are things which the bad kind of right-wing uh, guys talk about but I find myself um, having to position myself in that literature too because we, we are facing a serious risk. Now it also has a distinct European dimension which is important because we see that actually uh, there's a much higher uh, rate of jihadists among Muslim populations in Europe than among uh, Muslim populations in Muslim majority countries. Um, so we're talking about a, a global problem with a strong European dimension, but uh, we also probably have, or do we have a specific uh, a case for the Balkans? Is there a specific case for jihadism in the Balkans? Because there is a big literature, which you also see here, jihad in the Balkans, the next generation, you know, with the photo of Sarajevo as this brooding place of Islamist jihadism. Um, you know, is this what's happening in the Balkans? Is this different, uh, more deep-rooted, more dangerous somehow? 
Um, so this is what I'll be trying to talk about, also a bit about the Turkish uh, connection in that. And as I said, these are above all um, starting points for the debate which Faisal will then uh, take on. Um, but maybe starting with a brief uh, overview of the terms which are important in this debate, and most of you are quite familiar uh, with them, um, but sometimes it's just important to remember the differences uh, because Islamism and Takfirism and Salafism, th these are different uh, terms. Just have a look. I mean, Islamism is the broadest terms, uh, which uh, um, signifies a range of ideologies and movements that have a reference in Islam. They can range from moderate to democratic, or, uh, like the Muslim Brotherhood, the uh, the uh, Yugoslav or Bosniak version of that, the Mladi Muslimani or the AKP, even though, of course, I don't know why I thought that AKP would really fit under democratic, but um, <laughs> it just so happened. Um, um, and then, of course, we have the other extremist element, uh, the, the other extreme of that, and that will be uh, movements like Al-Qaeda. So, you know, Islamism as such is not uh, uh, illegitimate. It is like, in my views at least, like, uh, um, you know, um, Christian social, uh, Christian Democrats, uh, 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 a political movement with an ideology. But uh, there's another extreme on that range, and that is uh, that is not so nice. Now, with Salafism, we uh, have a literal, uh, very uh, conservative reading of Islam, which still doesn't have to be uh, violent at all. There are many Salafis who just uh, withdraw from everyday life in order to, leave, uh, to live uh, a life according to the rules of the prophet. There's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but uh, there are also Salafis uh, which uh, connect to other forms of uh, uh, tradition or to other forms of practice, rather, and uh, they might become violent. Now, then we have Wahhabism, of course, which has its roots in Saudi Arabia, um, and uh, which is, a, again, a very conservative reading of, within Sunni Islam, which becomes uh, powerful because of its coalition with the Assaud family, and together they create uh, Saudi Arabia. And that's where the money is, uh, and that's where like a lot of what is happening in the world of Islam now is being um, organized from and financed from. But then when we come to takfirism, we actually uh, talk about a practice uh, which is quite nasty, which declares opponents pretty much as apostates and uh, declares them as uh, um, good to be killed. And it's really this the combination um, of uh, Salafism, takfirism supported by Wahhabism, which then leads to what we today call uh, jihadism, which is very much a modern uh, ideology and which uh, combines these um, uh, traits. And, and that's where we are at the moment with the Islamic State. So as a very kind of brief uh, introduction. Um, now, <clears throat> of course, there's a lot uh, being written about uh, the Jihadi International. Um, um, uh, it has come into our attention, to our attention in the last few years, particularly uh, uh, in the Levant and in Africa with Al-Qaeda um, and with the murders and attacks in the UK, like the Le uh, Rigby murders <laughs> and so on. Uh, now, Gilles Kepel uh, distinguishes uh, three generations of Jihad, uh, and he's one of the leading scholars, obviously, on this. Um, and, uh, you know, the first generation uh, is really the, the source of the jihad in Afghanistan, uh, of course, U.S. financed at the time, uh, largely, uh, which then kind of uh, internationalizes through um, uh, conflicts, particularly in Bosnia and Chechnya, and particularly Bosnia is important because it creates, like, the networks we will briefly also talk about. Uh, now, uh, uh, and, 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 and then uh, uh, we have the third uh, generation jihad, which are the ongoing kind of big international, transnational conflicts. Um, but there's also a change there, what he calls the individual acts of terror, which is what we see in Europe very much, uh, you know, where you have like a loner who then kind of uh, acts uh, with a few supporters sometimes and, and has maximum uh, impact. Now, what Kepal argues, and what I think holds true, 
is that none of these different generations of global and transnational jihad have actually succeeded to win over the Muslim mainstream in any Muslim majority country or in any Muslim community anywhere. So it's always stayed very much a, a, a problem on the margins, but it has been very successful in, um, um, in uh, defining how Islam is being um, uh, being uh, seen in the world, but it also defines power relations within the religion, within the debate of the community. Now, when we now slowly move towards towards the Balkans, uh, before doing that, I mean, this is a great map because it shows um, the number of foreign fighters in Syria according to their country of origin. It's from uh, September 2014. Um, and as with all the other maps I'll be showing, I mean, of course, none of these numbers signify much. I mean, they could be 10 times larger or 10 times smaller. The only thing which we can kind of take from these maps is that they tell us about the relative uh, uh, numbers. And uh, I mean, what we see here is that, um, uh, and this is, not uh, I mean, this is not numbers relative to uh, the population, but the, the, the uh, total numbers of people from a given country who went to Syria uh, to fight. And, uh, and there you see uh, Tunisia and Saudi Arabia have you know, the largest population, so to say. Um, in Tunisia, this makes sense because uh, Tunisia is deeply politically deeply uh, unsettled and uh, there's massive unemployment, people just go there. But you also see, of course, quite big circles there in France, in Germany and Britain. And as you'll see in, 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 in later maps, they actually, I mean, the Muslim populations, of course, are much smaller there. So we're talking about relatively serious groups and also the smaller um, <laughs> circles. I mean, this is then uh, next to Turkey up towards Germany, that's then the Balkans. So, you know, these, there are several hundred people whom we think have come from Bosnia, Albania, and Kosovo to fight in Syria. Um, this is, again, I mean, again, uh, uh, many of these uh, um, graphs and numbers are very questionable, and we have to always ask big, uh, big, uh, uh, make big question marks. But it is interesting to see, you know, Albania, Bosnia, uh, Kosovo, uh, uh, the, the, you know, there are several hundred people um, who came from what we would call largely secular, non-religious environments to fight in Syria uh, and to join the Islamic State. And in, indeed, on the map, the mental map of uh, the Islamic State. Balkan is, the Balkans are present. Um, I mean, you see Andalus, Maghrib, Turkey is uh, divided into two, interestingly, and uh, the western part is Anatu, which comes from Anatolia, I uh, uh, assume. And the Balkans are indicated here as Uruba, <laughs> Europe, which is interesting. Uh, and Spain doesn't even <laughs> come under the uh, uh, Europe category. It has this and and as Andalus. It's like right uh, um, integrated into uh, Islamic history. But the Balkans in, in a very, I mean, actually, I think Austria is, might be in there as well. But uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's really the, Bar uh, the, the Balkans, which are uh, from the perspective of the Islamic State, um, uh, uh, relevant as what they believe uh, should be rightfully theirs. So as I, as I briefly uh, Managed, uh, uh, mentioned, um, there are jihadi fighters uh, with a Kosovar, Albanian, uh, Serbian uh, origin from Bosnia Herzegovina. It's interesting that the participation rates are much lower than in Western European countries. So the UK, uh, Austria has many more, uh, Austria as well, Belgium has many more jihadi fighters per Muslim population than uh, Bosnia or Albania or Kosovo have. But they do also have much higher participation rates than, for instance, in Turkey, and also much higher rates than in Bulgaria and Greece, uh, which is interesting as well. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, Bulgaria and Greece have are <laughs> relatively stronger states. I mean, Greece is still a much uh, has a much stronger state apparatus in Western Trace, for instance, than uh, most states in the Western Balkans, than Kosovo or, or Bosnia Herzegovina. So um, there is. Uh, 
uh, much more control, but also in Bulgaria and Greece we're talking about mostly Turkish uh, uh, populations which are linked to Turkey and Turkish institutions and which have very, very little um, um, exposure to Arabic language uh, networks, which is of course important. I mean, without the language you can't really connect to these international um, uh, uh, networks. Um, of course, it's also important to remember that you know when we talk about radicalization, identity, uh, religion, violence, um, it's very hard not to talk about Muslims and Islam because uh, current events force us to, to kind of take that into account. But uh, you know other things are happening as well, <laughs> like for instance Serbian fighters who've uh, joined. Uh, 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 Russia and the secessionists in the Ukraine, which is something which you will find, you will ha have to uh, search for in order to find it on the internet. And you won't find it that easily. It's just not being talked about that much. But it still is as important. I mean, there were also Greek fighters on uh, uh, the um, uh, Serbian side in the uh, Bosnian war, for instance. We, we don't happen to hear that much about them. Um, now, so the question is, why the Western Balkans? But one could also ask why there are not more uh, jihadists from Bosnia and from Kosovo. Because, of course, we had the wars uh, of the 1990s. I you know, don't have to go into them. Um, and we have a sort of a precedent, a network uh, in, in Bosnia, which goes back to the Islamist um, uh, a mobilization of the 90s and of course as I said at the beginning Bosnia was very much part of the second generation of the international or transnational jihadi uh, effort but as a, a, a counterpart to that in Kosovo the K K KLA never had any religious uh, orientation they, that was a staunchly secular uh, armed movement so it's interesting that the background is very different, but in terms of outcome, there's not much of a difference. So in Bosnia, you have this long-term uh, mobil mobilization, not only through um, uh, the institutions, uh, the Mladi Muslimani, Alia Izet Begovic, but also uh, through uh, the people who stayed after, who stayed behind after uh, the um, the war. I mean, they're kind of quite large. Not quite, no, I mean, there's some communities of foreign fighters uh, from. Uh, uh, you know, the entire Muslim world who, uh, who live in villages uh, and com communities in Bosnia. Um, in Serbia, uh, there's much more, uh, it's much more recent. Um, uh, and in the Albanian space, it's particularly interesting. I mean, uh, you know, that uh, Albania was the first country in the world to be declared as atheist, and uh, you don't see much of a religious, vibrant, vibrant religious life or even uh, religious institutions in Albania. It's interesting that even there uh, um, these networks had uh, quite uh, uh, an influence in attracting people. Now this is a photo which w was quite shocking. Um, it's the uh, Islamic State flag flying on the roof in Gorna Mauza in Bosnia Herzegovina and that's one of those um, uh, communities uh, which were established by um, the stay behind foreign fighters. Um, the, photo, uh, the, the flag was immediately removed the next day, but it uh, shows that it's a. a um, we're not talking about uh, um, theories here. This is uh, real. Now, so what are the reasons for jihadi mobilization? Um, obviously, uh, many uh, on several uh, scales. Um, as I said, the existing networks in Bosnia, but po poverty is, of course, a major issue. And also exclusion as minorities, uh, Muslims in Serbia, Roma and Bulgaria. The photo you see is actually a photo from Stolipinovo, which is a Roma neighborhood uh, in uh, Bulgaria, close to uh, Plovdiv. And, I mean, there are many worse photos. And it's, a, it's, uh, it's, it's like a settlement with tens of thousands of people without often running water and electricity. And this is actually the only place uh, in Bulgaria where uh, Salafis have made an inroad. With, uh, elsewhere, they're not that uh, visible. But I mean, the, the, you know, this is uh, not uh, the general situation in the Balkans, but in, Bul in, in Bulgaria, uh, this is uh, an important example. Um, so the lack of political perspectives, the um, 
you know, the, 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 the or, or political perspectives, the fact that, for instance, Kosovo's status is still not clear, Bosnia-Herzegovina's status is sort of clear, but nothing is really moving in any direction. It's a complete stagnation. Um, and of course, and very important on a transnational scale, the availability of funds of networks, not only of money, but also social mobility and meaning. I mean, you know, if you're an unemployed person without any prospects and some, there's someone who uh, promises you both like a better position in this world and in the next and creates opportunities for you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's something you can't that easily say no to. Um, of course, Saudi Arabia, again, is the most important funder in this, which is, of course, interesting because Saudi Arabia is also the most important US American ally in the region. So there's uh, also those kind of idiosyncrasies of international politics. Now, um, um, what is interesting is that uh, I have not found any evidence of, uh, I mean, there are many Turkish networks, I'll briefly talk about them. And, but we can't really, I mean, we can find the influence of the pre-existing networks there are missionaries in the region. Uh, there is radicalization through Europe, which is very important, particularly among the Bosnian and uh, Albanian communities in Europe and Austria, who have become kind of uh, modal, nodal points for international uh, uh, jihadists to get in touch. Um, so Europe is an important point of entry there. But Turkish institutions have played no role in this. Now, this photo is very interesting because when I first saw this, I thought, wow, how cool, it fits so well into my presentation. But then um, I actually uh, did a research on it. And um, uh, so this has become, this has gone viral in kind of, you know, Salah, kind of pro-Islamist uh, circles on the internet. However, it is actually a, uh, still from a music video by Sinan G, who is a German-Iranian uh, um, rapper, which is anti-Salafi. And uh, the original actually doesn't have uh, the, uh, um, the Bosnian uh, 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 um, flag there. It's just a white shirt. So it's quite interesting how that was kind of mistranslated. But, and I mean, forgive me these photos, this almost looks like, oh look, you know, we have these terrible Arabs and now the Turks, they're so nice and uh, do all these nice things uh, with which like, uh, you know, like um, uh, renovating uh, Ottoman mosques and establishing like the Gulen movement in universities and schools, studying, you know, Tika, the Turkish Development Agency, uh, helping Kosovo flood. Uh, um, um, uh, flood survivors. That's, of course, not my aim. I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that the Turkish presence in the Balkans has its problems in many ways for many people. It is very conservative. It's Turkish nationalist. It's neo-Ottomanist uh, at times. Um, um, and there could be, I could add a lot of other negative uh, things to that. But it has little connection to these international jihadi networks. However, that doesn't mean that there is no Turkish connection at all. There, Turkey has been called a jihadist highway uh, in the last uh, two years, three years. It was the main country through which pretty much all uh, uh, f foreign fighters in Syria from Europe and the Balkans went through, either by land or by Turkish airlines and so on. And there's no question that I mean, still the number of Turkish jihadis in Syria is very low. But uh, I mean, there's no way that uh, I mean, that the situation on the border uh, will not uh, kind of create new realities on the ground. So, uh, and we do see the emergence of Salafi uh, movements in Turkey for the first time. It didn't exist. There was no space for that. So I think it's definitely uh, something to watch. I mean, the Turkish government is now building uh, like a sort of a wall on the Syrian border, but it's never clean for what reason exactly, whether it's against the uh, Islamist fighters or against the Kurds, uh, we, 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 uh, is not very clear. Now, I'm about to come to, to the end, um, but so how, how worried do we have to be? And I really like this uh, paper by uh, Brookings, by uh, 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 Daniel uh, Byman and Jeremy Shapiro, which says, yes, be afraid, be a little afraid. Um, I mean, there is good reason to be concerned. Um, 
um, and to take this seriously. Um, there is this mobilization. It is a transnational phenomenon. There is a security risk in the region. Um, and it might actually grow. Um, uh, but we need to put things, of course, we need to put things in perspective. Um, I mean, a couple of thousands of people is nasty. I mean, you don't want to have uh, f even 3,000 really nasty people uh, amidst your communities. But we're not talking about hundreds of thousands. And that's, I think, important. And then I'd just like to remind you of Gilles Kepel's uh, conclusion, basically, that none of these generations of uh, global jihad have really had an impact on how Muslims in the major uh, the majority of Muslims position themselves in the world and in life, um, and this is true even truer for the Balkans in ma many ways because the example from Gordon Ma Mautza, which I showed, I mean this is not a role model for Bosnia. Nobody sees it that way. These are kind of ghettos which people look at often with a mixture of shock and um, you know belittlement. But of course. You know, there's no reason why, because also Gilles Capel has been um, um, uh, making this prognosis about the demise of jihadism uh, and, and, and violent Islamism for quite a while, but it still seems to be relatively um, alive. So it's something uh, we will have to live with. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. That really was very interesting. And what, as a non-expert in this region, what I thought I'd do is try to say something somewhat more general mm -hmm. about what you have just told us. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe we can have a little conversation before opening up uh, to the audience. It struck me the map that you showed us, the Islamic State mm -hmm. map, um, <coughs> uh, what's so interesting about it, apart from the way it draws or redraws borders, is that all the names come from quite distinct mm. periods of so-called Islamic history. Yeah. Um, you know, so as you pointed out, uh, Andalus from the Umayyad uh, and later mm. uh, al muhajir etc. Uh, kingdoms, uh, medieval, uh, to what's oddly called Europa, uh, uh, whose obvious historical link is to the Ottomans, mm. you know, completely separate in time and space. Then you have Khorasan, which is this earlier, you know, Arab thing, which includes a huge swath of territory. So these are old names, but they come from very different periods and quite different histories. And you never would have, in my view, found them all together on a single uh, atlas. So the, even the attempt to unify a mm -hmm. world geography actually must draw on quite distinct historical experiences that are incommensurable, that don't get put together by anyone or never have in the past mm -hmm. uh, been put together, which is um, uh, uh, very interesting. What gets divided up and what doesn't? Saudi Arabia is completely divided up into its <laughs> constituent regions, uh, for instance. Um, yeah. and you can see what they've been thinking or reading, mm -hmm. you know, because that goes up to Spain, you know, a bit of France is in there. And you can, s you know what the reference is, the Battle of Tours, Charles Martin, oh, yeah. right? It's there. Um, and similarly with other uh, with other places, and so, but yet some of the borders are completely vague, like Khorasan, i.e., you know, this bit that includes Iran and uh, Pakistan and Af you know all of these. Uh, it's all of Central Asia and beyond, in fact. Uh, so that first thing that there's a, a kind of spurious coherence, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't um, hold up uh, at all once you look even um, a bit more closely. But apart from that, um, I thought uh, a few points, three or four points. One is the place of Europe in this kind of imagination. Um, it's interesting how it's always Europe and not the West. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was saying in our discussion with Othon uh, uh, on, the, on the Charlie Hebdo uh, killings, how interesting it was that all the great mobilizations uh, of Muslims globally, which have invariably occurred around the figure of Muhammad, of the Prophet, uh, and I insults allegedly um, uh, made of or to him, have occurred through Europe, mm. by way of Europe, not anywhere else. So even where there have been attempts mm. to create a controversy such as the famous 
but not so famous because it was only regional um, uh, accusations by certain Islamist groups of the Bangladeshi writer Tasliman mm -hmm. Nasreen, those have remained confined to Bangladesh and India. They don't go global. It's almost as if Islam can only go global through Europe. Mm. Not even America, Europe. Mm. Uh, mm. Now, there's something quite interesting here, uh, that there is a, a link of mirroring or, you know, and you can see why that might be the case because of the long history that connects these two, if you will, worlds up. Although I'm not sure whether one should jump too quickly to the explanation that you often see preferred mm. in media of, you know, uh, this is a long connection, which includes colonialism, colonialism and the memory of it. Because as this map shows us, you know, colonialism is there in some bits and not there in others. So the Andalus thing is something quite different, and the other bits of the map um, uh, uh, represent different imagined mm -hmm. histories, which are all invoked much more explicitly in, say, the Islamic State's online journal, Dabiq, etc. Right? Um, so what are we talking about, this link? this umbilical cord almost between the idea of Europe and that of uh, militant Islam. Um, if Islam can only globalize itself through the idea of Europe, then I think you know, that connection merits some, uh, some more attention, an attention that's, that cannot confine itself to simply to marginalization of Muslim populations or the history of colonialism, uh, however important these might otherwise be. Um, I also think that it's so interesting how uh, the attempt of European Muslims to take over the leadership, or at least to start as sort of preaching the gospel of global Islam, um, strangely or not so strangely, um, lies alongside European state attempts to create European forms of Islam. In both cases, mm -hmm. you have the effort to make European Muslims the spokesmen for glo global Islam. Uh, and the foreign fighters are doing it in one way, and the government-funded Muslim institutions in this country and elsewhere in Europe are doing it in another way. But in a way, they're performing the same or a similar kind of function. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we are talking about, if you set aside the marginalization and colonial history argument for the moment, which is an important uh, history, but let's set it aside for the moment, then I think what you're seeing is perhaps um, this effort to have Europe in the, f in the form of its Muslim populations speak for global Islam. Uh, and this might be one reason why Islam is globalized in these great waves mm -hmm. of uh, these people outpouring on the street always to the pro at the moment in the name of the Prophet. Um, and then they die down again, but it always comes by way of Europe. So there's something, there's, I wonder if there's, there's mm -hmm. some moment of uh, mirroring or intimacy between those two projects, mm -hmm. which should give the Europe, these European states some pause uh, for thought. Right? That the creation of European Islam is not as hostile as you think it might be mm -hmm. to the making of the global jihadi as European. Um, uh, I would. I wonder also if it's possible to think of you know that list you gave us quite early on, of an Islamism and breaking mm -hmm. down and a new form Salafism etc. If one of the things we are seeing with these foreign fighters and the lure of Syria and the Islamic State uh, has what one of the things we are seeing is the decline of Islamism itself mm -hmm. as a Cold War largely Cold War political form. So of course Islamism which is itself a relatively new word, but uh, you can trace it, say, to Egypt in the 1920s, but in most of the world it's in the 40s, if not later. And it assumes this, if, it, if I might speak of it in the singular for the moment, it assumes this form, a very Cold War form, the establishment of an ideological state, mm -hmm. often through a revolution. Uh, now, you know these terms, we've heard them before, uh, the Iranian, the Islamic revolution in Iran is the only the most visible manifestation of it. It hasn't occurred in that way anywhere else, also interesting. Mm. But I wonder if we can see uh, in this violence not so much the um, inheritance of Islamism as mm -hmm. its destruction. That is to say, uh, you have the end of the Cold War project, with the end of the Cold War itself, um, 
and that the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria is, a, is simultaneously both a last ditch attempt to create mm -hmm. in a very perverse fashion indeed, because the Muslim Brotherhood, etc., would never <coughs> you know, mm -hmm. acknowledge this, a revolutionary state, mm -hmm. and it's an ideological state of the Cold War variety, but also to destroy it at the same time. Those mm -hmm. two things are going on. Um, uh, so I would uh, like to speculate that one of the things we are seeing happening here is the destruction of Islamism mm -hmm. and the consequent fragmentation of all of these um, forms of thinking uh, and practice. Um, it's also very interesting to note how, um, how there's been a breakdown of the idea of a Muslim mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, so we we all talk about, or many people in the media and elsewhere talk about mainstream Islam, you know, and how this stuff is not mainstream, which is true, of course. Uh, but perhaps one reason why there is some degree of attraction to this is that we see not just the fragmentation of Islamism, but of Islam itself as a category uh, and the idea of a mainstream. Um, I mean, I was reading an article recently by Muhammad Fadl, mm -hmm. uh, this law professor in Toronto, um, who's, who, was, who wrote about how this um, historic, what he described as a historic Sunni idea of being the middle community, you know, mm -hmm. the, the group that, is, that ha doesn't have extremes. So everyone else can be various forms of you know, extreme. Uh, but here, this is a community that's mainstream in that sense, mm -hmm. which is to say intellectually, ritually, doctrinally, um, and it is middling. It is moderate, in, <laughs> but not in, the, in our contemporary use of the word moderate, as in moderate Muslim. And so the question he asked is, um, is that finished? Mm -hmm. you know, is there a way in which these, not just the militant <coughs> forms of Sunni Islam, but self-conceptions of modern conceptions of Sunni Islam have given up on that, or that they can no longer lay claim to the idea of the mainstream, that there's been that sort of fragmentation. Or, I would like to add, has the idea of the mainstream now become a demographic idea rather than a doctrinal mm -hmm. idea? So increasingly you have these, um, uh, these uh, um, invocations of mainstream in terms of, after all, the Sunni community, and of course it isn't a community in any singular sense, because of its sheer demographic weight, must represent the truth and the, you know, all of this sort of thing. Um, so I, I think something might be said along those lines as well. The fact that all of this stuff then happens as it were on the margins um, is interesting uh, in, 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 in another way. Uh, you know, how is it that Afghanistan or the Balkans become the sites of battle? Of course, now it's in the, as it were, putative center of the Islamic world itself mm. in Syria mm. uh, and Iraq. I would like to suggest, though, that, you know, the use of the flag um, from, uh, uh, since I work on South Asia largely, uh, you may remember that there were recently um, a month, a few weeks and a month ago, these controversies of... Um, in one case, this a, a photograph of these young uh, 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 boys from Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. in southern India, all in their dhotis, holding up, smiling, you know, for a picture with the ISIS flag, right? <laughs> and it's a huge controversy, and of course it turned out that they had nothing at all to do with it, okay. and for them it just, uh, you know, meant, you know, this is some kind of statement of bravado, and, you know, they, they have no... The other one is slightly more sinister, but also comic in its own way, which is uh, the, the most famous, one of the most famous uh, web forums and websites, Jihadist, mm -hmm. Islamic State supporting one, which is called something Al-Sham or Sha Shami Witness, mm -hmm. right? It was in English. Uh, Sham is Syria. Uh, so Syrian Witness, which everyone, uh, including journalists who mined it for details and all thought, was being, you know, was coming out of the Middle East and was was actually run by an IT worker in Bangalore, in India. Uh, one Mr. Biswas was from Bengal, mm -hmm. from Calcutta or somewhere, and who was living uh, in his parents' house <laughs> and was a dutiful, uh, you know, worker and had not, you know, and it was blood-curdling. 
you know, it was all about let's massacre, you know, the Kurds and the Shiites and the what Yazidis and mm. the West is evil and all the rest. And here he was going about his daily business, very mild mannered, you know, working in a company, an IT company, and all the rest. So he's now in, being detained. He's been detained, mm. of course. Um, but this kind of vicarious imagination of the battlefront is very interesting, and it's interesting not simply that it happens, but that it produces some of the most important uh, sites for jihadi discourse mm. that are not produced by jihadis themselves, in other words. Right? This guy was not planning to go there. He was propounding all this stuff. Everyone thought he was Syrian or something. He managed to fool everyone. You know, Western intelligence agencies, journalists from around the world, and jihadis themselves. Amazing. Right? Until it was, I think it was a British newspaper that, uh, you know, figured it out and leaked it. And it was, I happened to be in India at the time. It was, it was front page news okay. there. So this stuff is actually very, it's, as I said, sinister, but it's also interesting in a That they themselves promulgate or not want to act upon them. Like you might ask yourself, what does Mr. Biswas, who's a successful computer programmer or whatever, he's in Bangalore, he's a story of success, Muslim success in India, right? Uh, how has he been marginalized and oppressed? Okay, he's a minority in India, but he's a successful one, right? And why does he hate all of these other people whom he's never met? Uh, you know, what in his personal experience might lead him to support this stuff? Um, in such a way and so effectively as to make his site into one of the top sites, jihadist sites, right? Um, that is a question worth asking and not simply in order to parse the question of responsibility, you know, is he an intending jihadi? Because what it allows us to do is actually clearly separate out the language of, you know, poverty, marginalization, colonialism, etc., from the support of these groups. But also, I will end here to show how Europe, and in this sense, more than Europe, uh, because it's in the English language, you know, you mentioned Arabic, mm -hmm. but I, I would say actually English yeah, yeah, is the yeah. global language mm -hmm. of Islam, which goes back to my first point on Europe, um, serves as a connector. I mean, the, the Islamic states, the magazine, the glossy magazines, and now their gruesome videotapes are very often mm -hmm. in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how they get picked up. That's how Muslim populations in other parts of the world that are not Middle East, from the Middle East have access to them. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting around in Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or uh, Tanzania or South Africa or uh, Malaysia, it's through English that you're very likely getting this stuff. Or Nigeria, right? It's not through Arabic. Uh, so I will end there because um, it, it brings me in an inclusio back to my first point mm -hmm. that the relationship between this these forms of militancy and um, global Islam um, and Europe mm -hmm. um, is a very very notable and is not only defined mm -hmm. by the history of marginalization or colonialism great so, so what do you think by what it is yeah. uh, I mean, what it is then I, I don't know, I just, but to, just to return briefly yeah, 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 yeah. to what little I know of the mm. Balkans, I mean, because that, the presence uh, of foreign fighters there, I would imagine, uh, is as problematic for local people as is the presence of foreign fighters, say Arab fighters in Afghanistan, mm. where they're cordially loathed, you know, or I imagine Europeans in mm. Syria. Um, I can't, uh, you know, uh, uh, imagine a situation in which these French women and all these people who are turning up um, in Raqqa and all mm. are, you know, warmly accepted, um, accepted by Islamic State. Mm. But everything we have read from the Al-Qaeda days of that the Islamic unity exists in the sense that everyone goes there, uh, but there is uh, huge uh, tension and even sometimes open conflict between ethnic and national mm -hmm. groups. So what you're not seeing is the elimination of ethnicity or nationality. Mm, of course. Mm. Uh, 
so we talk about the globalization of these movements, and it's true. Uh, but after the kind of technological uh, manifestation through web forums and social media and all the rest, Mr. Biswas sitting in Bangalore, mm -hmm. um, were he actually to go there, he'd be made to sweep the, you know, uh, the floor and resent it. Or if he were European, um, he would be given an, uh, a high and honored position because he could speak in a European language and pass off and all the rest and be resented by Mr. Biswas and others uh, to say nothing of local populations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, in other words, can, do you think that it's, too, it's far too early to write off the nation state and nationality and ethnicity in all of this? Do you see that happening in the Balkans? Well, I guess the history of the nation state in the Balkans, of course, and it is in itself yes, uh, yeah. a, 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 one of the main problems. Yeah. The fact that there is no, I mean, especially like Kosovo, Albania, Bosnia yeah. are all still very uh, insecure mm -hmm. uh, states. They're not nation states. They've come out of, uh, um, uh, of wars and uh, they're not very very legitimate. Uh, I, I think that's one of the main uh, problems. One, I mean, there, uh, there, there's so many important points you touched upon, and I, I think I, w I will only respond to a few in order to allow um, uh, you as well to, to join us in the discussion. But I think one important point is that actually in Bosnia, for instance, foreign fighters were very highly regarded mm -hmm. because the Bosnians really were left alone. Yes. And um, and they did welcome uh, the uh, the foreign fighters so much so that uh, I remember I mean when I first went to uh, Bosnia and I you know was walking around with a friend who was actually rather secular and we walked by uh, the Ira a very big Iranian Islamic uh, cultural center and I was very surprised to see uh, that right like spot on in the center of um, of. Uh, of, of Sarajevo, um, and you know, the guy I was talking to said, "Look, I mean, these guys have defended us. We are indebted to them." Um, and that I think it's only because of this indebtedness that we can understand places like Gorna Mauza, which really are. I mean, where, where I mean, I, there, there was also a uh, short film in the, in the Huffington Post where they interviewed people from the resident uh, with the residents on the village. Now, <laughs> I mean, that does look like. Uh, uh, I mean, they, are, they all are kind of Salafis with beards like this mm -hmm. and, um, you know, with uh, short uh, trousers in mm -hmm. a s very snowy, very cold mm -hmm. Bosn Bosnian kind of uh, setting. It's, it's very weird. And the fact that those places survive, even though the state uh, or the federation has repeated, repeatedly um, uh, raided those places, mm -hmm. tried to kick out people with foreign uh, 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 citizenship and so on. They didn't manage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's a very peculiar case for Bosnia. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in, in, in Kosovo, in, in uh, Albania, this is simply not, mm -hmm. not, not the problem, uh, not, not the case. So it's interesting that despite those very two, mm -hmm to different uh, historical experiences with foreign mm. fighters and with war, um, you still have mm. uh, the same uh, phenomenon. Now, of course, Europe is, is such a, um, you know, s s s such a complex thing, as, as we know. And um, when you look from uh, the, the bit of a Turkish perspective, which I do, of course, it, it looks, again, just very different. I mean, what you said about English is very mm. important. Of course, it's the international jihadi language. Uh, and so the reason why Turks are not uh, that mm. kind of present, present in it is not because they can't speak Arabic, which they can't, but they mm. also can't speak English. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> um, in a way that that helps, mm -hmm. it's just like the Turks in Germany who who do. I mean, where, where English has become mm -hmm. more of a uh, generally um, uh, 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 known language. Now, especially this. I mean, uh, you mentioned the issue of. I, I'm I'm dodging the question about Europe, though. I'm, mm -hmm. I uh, maybe we can discuss this and find something. I, I'm I'm aware that it's very important, but I don't know in what way, especially after mm -hmm. you've cut out all the things which I would kind of think about, like, you know, colonialism and, and no, all. No, no, those are you know, what, important, obviously. Yes, but, yeah. yeah, but what could be more important than that maybe we can uh, discuss. But the, the this kind of pop element of it, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, obviously we know, like, internet is very important in this. There is a popular culture 
uh, which has which is actually quite shockingly irreverent when you think about conservative forms of Islam. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kind of, uh, especially in Germany, uh, you have these uh, um, uh, rappers uh, mm -hmm. who use language which, you know, you know, they used to be kind of uh, immersed in a rather uh, kind of nasty sub uh, underworld kind of culture very mm. sexist very machist and so on mm. and they they very much use this in the new islamic propaganda islamist propaganda uh, um, uh, culture and it i think shows that ideology has become something else i mean it's not the kind of thing which even i think when i was at the university and so on took serious and thought like uh, you know we can fight for this we want to change the world it's become something out of the postmodern supermarket uh, mm. where you go and try and, and see whether it fits or not. I mean, that's what we've seen with, I'm sure you've heard about the two jihadi girls from Vienna, yes. which the Austrians did talk about in great detail over the last three months. And, uh, um, you know, these were two girls with Bosniak uh, a family background from Vienna, what the Austrians would call well-integrated, mm. no hijab, um, going to the discotheques, and then, you know, they've kind of uh, um, they radicalized, self-radicalized on the internet through these pop jihadi websites, and uh, traveled to Syria. And uh, um, are there, what were they called? I mean, all kinds of things. I mean, from jihadi sex slaves yeah. to, you know, but you know, they were both got married, and one was killed. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it's very hard to understand it because there has not been a kind of uh, ideological immersion in, yes. t into Islam is, yeah. uh, or into whatever, into anything. Yeah, that's why I mentioned you know. the kind of decline of Islamism as mm. an ideological form, but, you know, where you need mm. years of training and you need like any ideology of the, mm. received, yeah. of the kind we're familiar with. Here you have fragments, little mm. pieces, but therefore you have really quick so-called yeah. radicalization, yeah. something that was noted mm, mm, in the right. Intelligence Committee report mm -hmm. here after the, mm -hmm. you know, the London uh, tube bombing, the, you know, the, yeah. uh, and uh, that's why you have, you know, you speak of these Viennese girls, mm. but from England you have, again, famously, two guys who go off to mm. Syria, and what did they do just before they left? They ordered two books Islam from for Amazon, dummies. the Quran for dummies <laughs> yeah, and Islam yeah. for dummies, yeah. so it's like, well, hang on, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, so you're buying these like self-help things, like to know what it is that you're doing, and, you know, just while you already bought your ticket to go there. You know, what's happening? Is this like just extreme adventure? You know, stuff. Uh, what is it? But w what's not in it is ideology in yeah. any old-fashioned sense. And yeah. often no religion either. Yeah. I mean, what is often the case is that there is very little um, uh, understanding of. Of, I mean, they, they're not often not conservative or, uh, you know, uh, pious uh, mosque attending people, mm. um, which is very interesting. Of course, the fact that the ideological uh, radicalization is not very deep or very superficial doesn't make it less no, uh, yeah, dangerous. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it makes it more, more dangerous because it makes it much harder because uh, with an ideology you can actually, uh, you know, you can make an ar argument mm. with people who have an ideology. There's something else here. Mm. Um, which has probably something to do with youth culture, also with uh, and and with what's happening on the internet. Mm. I mean, you know, when you look at the beheadings, the videos of IS, uh, they do remind you of other kind of you know splatter mm. porn, which is uh, available on the internet. You know, everybody, like even children, have access mm. to kind of uh, images and 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 videos of such uh, violence and brutality. Mm. And often those IS videos look like uh, inept. Mm. of those uh, internet films. Mm. And let's also remember that there's you know, a number of countries, many of them Muslim, which are the, on the list of uh, those countries which have the most uh, view, uh, you know, porn mm. viewership. Mm. So Pakistan, I think, mm. is on the top. You would imagine, you know, like, hang on, Pakistan, where it's all illegal, but the top country in terms of porn, Western porn right. viewership, you know. But Everyone it, who's going into those internet cafes, that's what they look at. Huh? Uh, is there no government control then of those? They're all banned, of course. But you know, you would go there and it's easy to circumvent. Okay. Uh, but if you've ever been into a, a internet website, when you're, when you're going there and you know, if you type it, in, you'll see what all the previous searches have been. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no attempt to, that's why they exist. Yeah. Uh, it is not because people can't afford computers at home, mm. it's you need to go to this place. 
um, okay. where you have this kind of strange viewership of porn collectively. Mm -hmm. Everyone is sitting in their little booths and, you know. I mean, what you said about the map, I, th I, I thought really exciting. I mean, the fact that it looks as if this is like a plan for the future, like a strategic uh, thinking, but in fact, it's uh, the mental map of uh, brains in disarray, right? Where you kind of uh, bring together, mix up uh, different histories. Uh, I mean, there's no historicity, there's no, no. coherence in this. Um, it doesn't make sense, um, but that doesn't make it less um, influential and less efficient, it seems. I mean, so some bits of it are blown out of proportion to what they, in, you know, like Maghreb. Mm. You know, it's like includes all of West Africa and much of Central Africa. And then other bits are shrunken or whatever their size, like the Saudi, you know, the Arabian Peninsula is, yes. you know, proportionate, as it were. Then you have Abyssinia, which is blow, again blown out of proportion and called Abyssinia. So, and that reference goes back to the days of Muhammad who sends an embassy to the Nagus, right, of Abyssinia. So the words have very particular references, but they are two completely disconnected histories. They are not to anything that's connected up in any single narrative as any ideological. Where does Anatol come from? I mean, Anatolia doesn't have any uh, uh, Islamic uh, no. reference. It's, it's the Greek word, actually, Anatoliki. Yes. So um, it seems they haven't quite made their minds up about that part, which is reassuring. <laughs> and, you know, with the Balkans, the, you know, they could call it Balkan or something, but they don't. Oh, well, sorry, yes, yeah. yes. you can probably continue for hours. Yeah. <laughs> so questions, comments, yes. <clears throat> um, I have a question for Karen, um, and the, then a question for you. 